The final segment of tonight's Woodbury County Board of Supervisors Candidate Forum brought to you by the League of Women Voters in conjunction with Western Iowa Tech Community College Mass Media Program and Western Iowa Tech Community College Journalism Program. In addition, uh, KCAU Siouxland Proud website is also uh, airing this and both uh, KCAU and WIT TV will have this on their websites until the election. So thank you all for your cooperation and making this happen. Um, we have with us now for uh, the District 5 representatives running for office, we have Republican Rocky DeWitt and Democrat Patty Erickson Putnam. Our, our forum um, panelists tonight are Teresa Weaver Basie from the League of Women Voters, Kristen Barnes from um, Western Iowa Tech Community College um, Mass Media Program, and Hannah Adamson from KCAU 9 News. Um, thank you for being here and, and for sticking around for all three segments here. Um, we are going to be following the same format that we followed for the previous two segments. So each of our candidates will have one minute to give an opening statement. After that, we will be turning to our panelists who will be taking turns asking questions. Each of you will have 60 seconds to answer each question and we will alternate who goes first. Okay, so um, Patty Erickson Putnam, we're going to start with you and you have 60 seconds to give an opening statement. My name is Patty Erickson Putman. I'm glad, happy to be here this evening. I want to thank the League for uh, continuing this with the challenges with COVID-19. Um, my background is in local government. I have worked through either Simcoe or Woodbury County for the past 35 years and worked with various um, offices and departments from uh, law enforcement to uh, courthouse restoration. Um, over the course of about those 35 years, I've brought in about $10 million um, in gr federal grant money for a variety of purposes. So I'm well aware of federal state guidelines and requirements for grant administration. Um, writing grants just gave me an opportunity to learn and continue to learn uh, over the various functions in government. So. You know, I now live on a farm outside Pearson, Iowa with my husband, and we've been married for 36 years. Thank you. Rocky DeWitt, would you please give us your 60-second opening statement? Uh, I'm Rocky DeWitt, running for re-election uh, for my second term for Woodbury County Supervisor. Uh, it's been a steep, steep learning curve. I've enjoyed every minute of it. There's been some challenges, obviously. I'm looking forward to the next four years. Uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress with the law enforcement center, the bond issue. We've, we've come a long ways with secondary roads. Uh, we've had a lot of things dumped in our lap that I think were overlooked or, or under, under misunderstood for the last 30 plus years. And uh, we're doing what we can to put this back together. We want this county to move forward. We want more job growth, we want lower tax levies, and we're, we're after what's right for Woodbury County. Thank you. Thank you. And we are now going to turn to our panelists to ask their questions. And we're going to start with Ms. Barnes down at the end there. If you would direct your first question to Mr. DeWitt. Mr. DeWitt, how would you oversee the operation of the new jail to ensure that the ongoing balance between facility maintenance and operations compared to other priorities in the budget? You know, I sit on the LEC authority as well as the Board of Supervisors. So the authority does have jurisdiction over that building, that structure for 20 years or until the uh, bond issue is retired and or the LEC authority is, is dissolved as well. Uh, the authority will have complete control over that. There's already mechanisms in place to have 20% uh, of the money that comes in as revenue to go towards building maintenance and the other 80% will go towards uh, buying down the bonds, getting the, getting the debt paid off. Thank you. Ms. Erickson Putnam. Would you answer the same question, please? Uh, well, the, the LEC being in an authority, uh, that's the first time the authority has been used for a project this large. So I think everybody's going to be learning as they go along. Um, you know, re 
what resting on the income for federal prisoners, I think, is something that's going to have to be played out. I think there's some real questions there as to number of federal prisoners and are they going to contract for a specific number and then pay that specific number, whether or not they use those beds. Um, I, you know, I'm not uh, sure on how that's going to be handled. I did serve on the previous uh, law enforcement center, new construction committee. Uh, quite some time ago, and that was just resoundingly defeated by Woodbury County taxpayers. So glad to see it. It's been necessary for a long time, and we'll go forward from there and, and learn and make it the best we can. Thank you. Ms. Weaver-Basie, will you please direct your question to Ms. Erickson Putnam? Uh, Ms. Erickson Putnam, uh, if elected, what are your top three priorities? My top three priorities um, I was hired by Woodbury County originally to implement a case management program for um, mentally dis uh, disabled individuals with uh, developmental disabilities, uh, chronic mental illness, or um, develop now it's called developmental disabilities again. So that was my priority coming in, and then to shape a system that was responsive to disabled population needs. Um, so my first two priorities are kind of intertwined. Uh, they're going to be restoring and assuring the fiscal stability for mental health services and assuring equitable services for mental health and disability services needs for Woodbury County people. Uh, going into the region, I think that, that has created some um, unique problems and they need to be addressed. Thank you. Mr. DeWitt. My first three priorities are gonna be to make sure that the LEC is finished under budget if possible, or at least in budget. Uh, secondary roads, I want to make sure that that project is done. It was 30 plus years in the making. It's not going to get fixed overnight, but we're already making steps to go forward with that. Obviously, we all want lower tax levies uh, to keep property taxes as low as we can possibly make them without dropping services. That is huge. We have been a huge proponent of cutting costs without cutting services. Um, I disagree with my opponent on the mental health region. We've had nothing but kudos and improved services from, from where I sit on the government's board. Rolling Hills has been a, a, a smashing success. Thank you. Ms. Adamson, will you please direct your first question to Mr. DeWitt? Mr. DeWitt, considering that county road and gravel road projects could cost the county millions of dollars over the next five years. Where is the county at regarding those roads that need to be fixed? And if elected, how would you move things forward? We're already moving forward on getting some of those, the problem areas resolved. In fact, there's a couple of areas down by Hornick and Smithlin that have been just proved prob true problem children for years. The base has been gone. Uh, down there in the Les Hills area, the soil is obviously different than it is elsewhere in the county, but we've come a long ways already with getting some of the worst problem areas fixed. Uh, again, that money is going to be coming in. We're going to be getting those problems taken care of. It, this was a long time in the making. It's not gonna get fixed overnight, but we want to make sure that it is done right and we go forward fixing every mile that is that needs it and, and going back to the standard of maintaining every mile of every road every year. Thank you. Ms. Erickson Putman. I, I live on those gravel roads out there, uh, so I'm well aware of what condition they're in. And I think secondary roads does an absolutely fantastic job given what they've been uh, given to deal with. Um, I know the base on some of them are gone, um, but I think the board has another problem in that um, I know there have been farmers that have invited board members out to see their operations and really review um, I only know of one board member that has ever gone out and accepted that invitation. And farming now is a corporate type of deal. Um, so the size of the equipment going to track um, corn, uh, sorry, I forget, <laughs> going, going to the big corn wagons coming in that are on tracks that carry 700 <laughs> bushels of corn or any kind of grain. And one gentleman out there does, you know, a thousand semis in and out of his place a year. That is considerable <laughs> wear and tear, and I hope we can address that. Thank you. Ms. Barnes, would you please direct your question to Ms. Erickson Putman? Ms. Erickson Putman, 
In regard to COVID-19, what do you think the greatest challenge to the county will be in the future? For instance, what about funding for Siouxland District Health? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah. In regard to COVID-19, what do you think the greatest challenge to the county will be in the future? For instance, what about funding for Siouxland District Health? Well, I think right now COVID-19 has to be kept control of and uh, we need to participate highly in that in those recommendations for masking and, and uh, set, uh, social distancing as well as frequent cleaning. Um, Siouxland District Health is, has been a great organization for a long time for Woodbury County um, and I think those needs need to be addressed and looked at. Uh, if there is a problem area, they need to be able to bring it before the board and ass be assured or uh, that the board is going to listen to them and proceed on what needs to be done to keep everybody as safe as possible. Thank you. Mr. DeWitt. Uh, the Sioux Line District Health has, has its own budget. They have their, their leadership in place. Uh, I think Sioux Line District Health has been, health, excuse me, has been exemplary in uh, providing, you know, guidance, insight, progress, things to do, things to, things to be involved in. But uh, going forward, I am obviously concerned about something that's more contagious, more, more, more deadly, what, what have you, than C-19 has been. Um, I think we're in for a new, new awakening, perhaps, on what some of these con communicable diseases are going to be. But I also believe that Siouxland District Health is at the forefront of, in our area, for keeping things moving forward. Thank you. Ms. Weaver Basie, would you please direct your question to Mr. DeWitt? Mr. DeWitt, how will you work to earn the trust of voters from the entire county? That's interesting because I've already been endorsed by the Western Iowa Labor Federation, uh, Carpenters Local 948, as well as the Good Government Committee from the Siouxland Chamber of Commerce. I have worked with almost all of the mayors in the county. I've worked on several issues individually and as groups. Uh, with various citizens and, and town halls, that sort of thing. I've worked with businesses large and small. Uh, I have worked with the sheriff's office. I've worked with secondary roads. I have been out on those roads with the engineer and others. And uh, I, I think I have that rapport. I, I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a gravel road. I know what it's like to live out there. So I've also been involved in, in business small and large in this, in this tri-state area. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Erickson Putman. Well, I, you know, I've, I've written grants that have included the law enforcement, um, Sioux City Police Department, uh, communications, um, a wide variety of operations. I've worked with all those departments. I've um, benefited from secondary roads when, um, you know, we have to be served out there. Um, I do think that the board needs the board does go out and meet with small communities but the problem area may be where they can build another trust level of trust factor and relationship isn't going out and seeing those farming operations the face of agriculture has changed and even though 80 percent of the population within woodbury county is in the sioux city metro area and communities i think they need to touch base with those farmers out there and, and get their input and their ideals ag is a huge business it needs to be recognized as such Thank you. Ms. Adamson, will you please direct your question to Ms. Erickson Putman? Ms. Erickson Putman, Woodbury County will soon have a new jail and a new sheriff, essentially starting off with a clean slate. How do you see the relationship between the Sheriff's Department and the Board of Supervisors developing? Well, again, I'm not real clear on how the authority is and um, how that will be developed, but I've worked over the years with the sheriff's office, I'm familiar with, you know, different construction mecha uh, mechanisms for law enforcement centers, whether it's linear or pod or direct supervision. So I'm familiar with those things. My biggest concern there is that um, we have a mental health court, an existing mental health court. It was the first one in the state of Iowa. We need to be assured that that mental health court is going to continue forward. And... Um, provide the impact and the quality of life and uh, improvements to individuals that being mentally ill is not a crime, okay? So we need to make sure that we continue to work with that effort there to make sure that our mentally ill are not jailed and incarcerated. I know the guys don't want it. Um, don't want to jail people with mental illness, let me clarify that. Um, so uh, that's one of my biggest concerns and I would really have to look and see how the authority relates to the Board of Supervisors. 
Thank you. Mr. DeWitt. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Woodbury County will soon have a new jail and a new sheriff, essentially starting off with a clean slate. How do you see the relationship between the sheriff's department and the board of supervisors developing? Uh, I've already been in contact with, with candidate Sheehan. Uh, I've, I've known his parents for years, which is of no importance, but uh, I've known the family for a long time. I think moving forward, he's going to have a learning curve as well. Coming from the police department, sheriff's office is an entirely different animal than a, than a PD. But uh, I think he's going to have, he, he's, Chad has been attending some of the meetings for the LEC authority, and he's becoming acquainted with it. He's been in contact with uh, uh, Chairman Wick and, and I at least a couple of times on asking questions and being involved. So I think the transition should be pretty smooth. And uh, we've, we've had pretty good rapport between the, the board and the sheriff's office anyway. So I think we're just gonna bring Mr. Sheehan up to speed and I think all will be fine. Thank you. Ms. Barnes, would you please direct your question to Mr. DeWitt? Mr. DeWitt, Woodbury County is asking for a little over $1.3 million in COVID cost reimbursement from the CARES Act. How do you intend to ensure that this reimbursement money is distributed fairly among the communities in the county? I haven't heard much of, uh, of askings for, for them to be distributed throughout the county yet. For the time being, the board plans to put that money into reserves. Our, our, our general fund is a little bit lower than we'd like it to be for the reserve funding. So for the time being, we plan on putting that one million and change uh, in reserve to keep that build up obviously with the COVID issues coming too, is there's there's probably going to be if not already has been some some uh increase in the uh, uh tax abatements uh i'm sorry tax payments that the withholding of the property taxes due to hardships so we're going to need to have some money to rely on going forward to make sure that we can keep the government going the county government in, in place and moving thank you Ms. Erickson Putnam, will you please answer the same question? Could we have the question repeated? Sure. sure. Woodbury County is asking for a little over $1.3 million in COVID cost reimbursement from the CARES Act. How do you intend to ensure that this reimbursement money is distributed fairly among the communities in the county? I'm going to assume that they had to have some kind of statistics and data to submit and request that $1.3 million, especially if it's you know, being delivered as a reimbursement type um, payment to the county um, so there I you know I think you just need to sit there and you have, have to look at what was your data submitted to the feds for that reimbursement and how can you prorate that out if it's not already been done so thank you Ms. Weaver Basie will you please direct your question to Ms. Erickson Putnam Ms. Erickson Putnam have you ever tended attended a poverty simulation workshop or diversity training, and would you consider asking that such trainings be held for the supervisors and other county employees? And please explain. I have not ever attended either one of those two items. Um, I'm a licensed social worker for the, you know, and I've attended a number of trainings that way. But yes, I think both of them uh, would be critical right now, this time and place. Um, it's all about understanding and knowing and changing our behavior and being supportive and going <coughs> forward. Thank you. Mr. DeWitt. I have not attended those type of trainings. I have been through various trainings, obviously sexual harassment, both as an employee and as a manager. Um, dozens of safety, other issue type of trainings that go along with that. I have not been to a diversity training. I will put it as bluntly as I can, I am not opposed to diversity training, but the county is a unique animal in that we have the Board of Supervisors responsible for X amount of employees, and then we have four more elected officials. I would like to see each individual elected sheriff, county attorney, and treasurer, and so on, that they pick their own diversity training because of their employees, because of their standard set of needs. Um, and going forward, if we're going to adopt any diversity training, I want to have some insight. I don't want to just grab the first training that comes along and say that this is what we're going to go with. I want to be involved in that, in that selection for training. Thank you. Ms. Adamson, will you please direct your question to Mr. DeWitt? 
Mr. DeWitt, do you feel the county has done enough regarding COVID health protocols? And if not, what more could they do? I think the county has been over and above on what they need to do in both, in both dealing with the C-19 issue and, and keeping the courthouse open. The treasurer's office, once again, is an autonomous office and that he is, he is elected. He did opt to close his office for a short time, I believe at two different occasions. That is up to him. That is up to the treasurer. We did our level best to keep all of the courthouse open as much as possible. But you have to remember that the courthouse has three different entities, city, county, and state. So we were dealing with a lot of different issues. The court system, for the most part, shut down except for emergency services like uh, domestic abuse, mental health, things like that. Uh, but we kept the auditor's office. Uh, you know, the board office was open the whole time. We did do masks. We did do sanitizing. The, the cleaning crew at night is, is sanitizing just nearly every surface in the courthouse. And going forward, I, I don't see any change in that. I, I think we're doing what we can with what we've got. And Ms. Erickson Putman? You know, I visited the courthouse over the course of time here that COVID has about been there. Uh, and I've been impressed with the way that, that they have been handling it. Um, the county employees, you give them a charge and they, they complete it is what I've found over the years. Um, so I've been impressed with what they've done. They've kept things open. They've kept to, they've kept being responsive to the needs of the taxpayers. Um, you may have to make a few little, you know, additional moves to get where you need to get to. Um, but other than that, I think the, the personnel there has done a tremendous job and kept a tremendous attitude in doing it. Thank you. Ms. Barnes, would you please direct your our final question to Ms. Erickson Putman? Ms. Erickson, or Erickson Putman, what steps should the board do to help the county grow in population wise? I think that, that Anytime you want to grow, what you want to expand, you have to be assured that there's, you know, education available for, available for training. You have to make sure there's uh, quality of life issues that are addressed. You have to recruit in what is your stronghold, what is your strength. Uh, if you can diversify, you need to jump on it. Um, but it's all, a, it's all a part of a balance, checks and balance kind of thing that you have and you don't ignore any one of those things at the same time. Um, you know, it's best for Woodbury County to be a um, destination rather than a pass-through location. And we need to assure that and cannot forget the importance of ag um, and other professions as they come forward. This place here is just great, and I don't know how many people know about it, but it's absolutely fantastic. And that should be brought to the forefront, too, for opportunities for our youth. Thank you. Mr. DeWitt. Can I have 10 minutes to answer this question? <laughs> no, you the, can have one. <laughs> we, Woodbury County sits in a very unique in, uh, situation with the tri-state area. We're, we're, as far as population growth, job growth, that kind of thing, we're not only dealing with our own problems within the county and the state, and their job growth opportunities, but the state of South Dakota is is just downright brutal on, attract, on attracting businesses. Nebraska is not that much different. So we're really struggling. I would like to see more utilization in some of our small towns, especially now that the Highway 20 corridor is finally four-laned. Uh, as, as my opponent says, obviously the agriculture, we need to maintain that as much as possible. That, that's a huge part of our Woodbury County economy. Um, but I'd like to see some expansion southward from Sioux City with the uh, with the industrial interchange down there. That's that's soon to be uh, in 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 final phases. But uh, we we face a lot of challenges. Our economic development uh, director is doing a fantastic job along with Simcoe and doing what we can to keep this thing rolling. Thank you, and I want to thank you both for participating tonight in our forum. And I, uh, in particular, want to thank you for your service to our community and to the citizens of Woodbury County. We appreciate the service that you have both rendered. Thank you. I would also like to thank our panelists, Kristen Barnes, Teresa weaver Basie, and Hannah Adamson. Thank you, ladies, for being here and for asking your questions. 
Um, in addition, we would like to thank KCAU, Sulen Proud, for live streaming this event and for uh, posting the video. And in addition, our wonderful staff here at Western Iowa Tech Community College, Chris Mansfield and Steve Warren's staff, have helped us out tremendously. If it weren't for these gentlemen and their efforts, we would not be in this studio. We would not be able to bring this event to you. So thank you both for, for making this happen. Links to the videos from both the September 30th and tomorrow night, we will have an October 1st candidate forum for our state and um, also for the county auditor, will be up on the League of Women Voters of Siouxland Facebook page, as well as at the SiouxlandProud.com and WITCC.TV. Um, you can click to your YouTube channel to find us. For more information about the candidates, go to vote411.org. You will be able to compare the candidates and their responses to various questions that obviously we did not have time to ask tonight. We were only able to cover a small portion of the things we know that you are concerned about. The League of Women Voters of Sioux City encourages everyone to vote. If you do not feel comfortable voting at the polling locations on November 3rd, you may request an absentee ballot or vote early at Long Lines Rec Center, 401 Gordon Drive, Sioux City, beginning on October 5th. Uh, this option will be open Monday through Friday from 8 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon until October 29th. Um, on October 30th, 31st, and November 2nd, Long Lines will be open from 8 till 5. Thank you all for joining us virtually and watching and becoming informed about the candidates. And uh, there will be an, uh, an additional candidate forum tomorrow night, and we hope that you will turn in for that. We will also be, we will be, uh, have the Iowa House Districts 13 and 14 and the County Auditor tomorrow night. So I hope to have you tune in then. Thank you all again for being here and joining us tonight.